Hey everybody, thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Drew Olson, nice to meet all of you. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about composable queries with Ecto. Um, so just to sort of inform my talk and try to do some like just-in-time audience stuff, uh, who has used Ecto before in the audience? Okay, awesome. Um, who's uh, like put a Phoenix app with Ecto into production? Smaller version. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, so the things I'm going to cover today. I'll do a brief uh, Ecto introduction, talk about sort of the standard way we usually write queries. Or you, you would see queries written in Ecto when you look at like sort of blog posts or online presentations, things like that. Um, I'll talk about query expressions, which are an alternative syntax to building Ecto queries that are baked into Ecto. Uh, and I'll talk about how we compose all these types of queries to sort of reuse and allow sort of like uh, when, when, when our applications get larger, we want to talk about sort of how we can reuse sort of shared components of queries uh, for multiple consumers. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about something I'm calling query pipelines, but are basically, spoiler alert, just data pipelines. Uh, so, uh, but for, first and foremost, um, when I give presentations, I really like it if people have questions during the talk, just like shout them out, raise your hand, tell me to slow down, tell me to go back over something if you don't understand. So let's get this thing going. Okay. Uh, so. Introduction to Ecto. So a lot of people know what it is, um, but just from a high level, uh, Ecto, I like to think of it as basically a lightweight ORM. Um, so it's an easy way to get information from your databases, to write information to your databases. Um, but it, it, it takes a lot of really awesome parts from a lot of different patterns and sort of bundles it all together. So I like, it, it sort of reminds me of like a link style query syntax. Um, it's got sort of the data mapper thing going on when you describe your schema inside your Ecto model. Uh, it's got the repository pattern going on when you write and read information from your database. So it's, it's some, some really cool stuff all bundled together. Um, and I think Ecto's, for me, the primary library that really makes other ecosystems jealous. Like, thanks, I think Eric's not in the room, but it's fantastic. Uh, Eric and Jose and everybody who's worked on it. It's, it makes, I've been <laughs> trying to evangelize Elixir for a really long time to my coworkers, and Ecto is sort of like the real foothold. People really, really like it immediately when they see it. So, okay. Um, so the things I'm going to talk about today are extracted from some real applications that I've worked on. Um, I'm like shoehorning Elixir in slowly to Braintree where I work uh, by writing internal applications in it. Um, and I'm going to use a few models, really simple ones, to build all the patterns off of. So uh, you'll have these models and we'll just sort of like look at example queries and then talk about how we can build those up to do a little bit more complex stuff. Okay, I'm going to use the, the very boring a post has many comments uh, example, but it's going to be plenty for us to really dig into understanding what queries are like in Ecto and how we can do some interesting stuff with them. So um, who's, who, who, everyone knows what an Ecto model looks like, right? Or most people do. So uh, this is a post. Um, that post has a body. Uh, it has a Boolean that determines whether or not it's published. It has an Ecto date uh, that determines when it was published. And it has a title of the string. We also have a relation to comments, to has many relation. And then we have the comment module as well. So the comment module um, has a body, has a commenter. I threw in the idea of votes, so it's an integer. So you can sort of have people upvote and downvote your comments. Um, and then it has the belong to relationship back to post as well. So that should all look familiar. OK, so Ecto has two styles of writing queries built into the sort of like standard library for the, for the library. The most common that you would see is called the keyword query syntax. So I, I pulled both of these terms directly out of the docs. Um, but most of the time, when you're seeing a blog post about Ecto, when you're probably writing your first applications that use Ecto, things like that, you're using the keyword query syntax. So this is the thing that like, feels like link. Um, this is the simplest example of a query in Ecto, basically. So baby's first query. This is what, this is what all my queries looked like when I started using Ecto. I think um, there's two important things to see here. So we have our application repository, which is what's actually like fetching the data, and then we have the query that sort of sits inside it. Um, but when I started using Ecto, they were, they were sort of one and the same. Um, I would always sort of have the my repo dot all or dot one, and then inside of it, I would sort of just like write the stuff that I wanted it to do, and great. It sort of like, you know, it executed that query, gave me back my stuff. We're all well and good. Um, so I, how many people are writing queries that look like this on their applications mostly? Okay. Cool. Um, so I think the first interesting thing to think about here, and the first thing that really set me on a different course of thinking about how to build Ecto queries is extracting the construction from the, of the query from the execution of the query. Um, so this is how I started writing them. But I think separating them, it, it's, it's a really simple thing. 
but it's going to inform your thinking about how to actually use Xdo to construct and execute queries. So it's, I don't know, basically it's extract query refactoring. It's pretty simple, right? I, I took the query that was inlined into the myRuka.all call, I pulled it out, gave it a name, and then we passed that, uh, that variable into the all call later. So while it's a simple thing to do to extract this code, it's actually pretty powerful to think about the fact that it, the query itself is data, right? It's a thing, it's, it's, it's a data structure that you're operating on. So pulling it out and giving it a name is actually really useful and, and, and to help you understand like it's not intimately tied to that repository. It's in fact like very explicitly decoupled from it. And that, that's super important. So these style of queries can get uh, pretty fancy, I guess. Um, there's, there's lots that you can do with them. So here's an example of a query that has just, you know, a bunch more clauses. But it's still uh, the, the, that keyword query syntax, right? So we're doing, this time we're selecting from, uh, from some C in comments. We're going to join to post through that uh, associ method, which I really like. It used to be that you had to, uh, you could like directly drop in the relation, but then you had this weird thing where you had to call like get on the association to actually get it to show up in views. I think this is a really good call. I'm glad they did this. Um, then we have sort of like a compound um, constraint in our where clause. We can use and, and we say, okay, we want to only get back comments where the post ID is one and the votes on the comment are greater than five. And then last but not least, we do a select. So we say like, okay, I know I joined this to posts, but I want back just the comments. And again, we just store that in a variable. Uh, and then when we're ready to execute the query, we pass it to repo.all, get back our rows. Pretty, pretty straightforward. So, who is, is even familiar with the idea of query expressions in, Ex in Ecto? Okay, good. Otherwise, this would have been way underwhelming. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> yeah, so I think most people that use Ecto use the keyword query syntax, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's, it's really elegant. Um, you, can, you can express something that's, that feels really close to SQL while having sort of this nice higher level abstraction that makes it easy to work with as well. Um, but there's sort of like a like a bizarro world version of the API, or like a mirror world, um, where all the same functionality is exposed through something that's called query expressions. So I'm gonna do some translations from the last couple of queries so you can understand sort of what something looks like in the keyword query syntax, and then what it looks like in the query expression syntax. You can effectively think of the query expression syntax as extracting each of those um, sort of keywords inside of the keyword uh, syntax, into its own function. And generally the functions follow a similar signature. Not always, and you'll see that joins are a little bit different. Um, but generally, they take as their first argument a query. As their second argument, they take a list of what I'll call bindings, that which may be the incorrect uh, terminology, but if it is, I'd love to hear it. Um, and then you can use those bindings in the third clause, which is effectively your constraints, or, or the things that you're doing in your query to, to change the subject query. Yeah, go ahead. I am familiar with Rails. So is this in some way a Rails-ish? No. Uh, <laughs> it looks like it though, kind of. Um, yeah, and so I, it actually like, I'm really glad you asked that question. That's kind of the direction that the, the presentation is going. So um, we'll talk about basically me thinking too much about ARL and trying to re-implement scopes, which is a terrible idea. We'll get, we'll get to that. Uh, so the key here is that this is, um, it's a data transformation. That's what's different from ARL. There's no laziness here, it's explicit. Um, you pass a query in, you add constraints to it, and you get a new query out, okay? So let's see what the fancy query looks like getting translated from the keyword query syntax to query expressions. So they look kind of similar when you're doing it like this, right? But um, I think one of the reasons that folks tend to shy away from the query expression syntax is it's a little more verbose. Um, you have these like, weird bracketed things with underscores where I'm ignoring the, the bindings that I don't care about for a particular clause. Um, but, but it looks like if you squint at it, it looks like about the same. Um, for example, like uh, the join sort of looks pretty similar, but you're sort of specifying the direction of the join first. Um, you'll notice that before the join, I only have a single binding, which is C, the comments. And then by performing the join, this is interesting, right? This is a, this is a query in, query out, but rather than constraining the results in the query, we're actually expanding them at this point, right? Uh, by joining, we now have like these two bindings, we have more rows like, to work with. Um, so in the subsequent clauses, I'm deciding whether I'm gonna operate on 
either the post or the comment, or in some cases it could be both. But I'm not, I'm actually doing anything uh, with, with both in any of these clauses. So that's sort of like an example of a more complex query expression. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, go ahead. You could, yeah. So, so I, I, for example, could take those two components of the where clause and stick them together in a single call to that function and put an and between them. It so I, it doesn't have to, but the ordering matters. Um, it, yeah, it's it's, a, it's effectively sort of like the the direction that you start from, like the, the, the sort of the source table that you start from, will kind of always be first in the subsequent uh, expressions, if that makes sense. Um, and, and I think, like, hopefully I'll have some more examples that make that a little bit clearer. Anything else? Okay, cool. So knowing these two things, I think like the first thing that, that started to happen to me when I was building large applications with Ecto is I started to think to myself like, okay, this is nice, it's flexible, it's really readable, I like it a lot better than uh, Arrow or you know, Active Record, but like, how do I share like, semantic meaning, like fragments from the queries between different things that want to use that same idea? Um, and so my, my initial take on this, because I'm sort of conditioned as a, as a Rails developer, I guess, um, was like, okay, I, I, I want to re-implement scopes somehow. So I want to be able to like make a mac, of course I was like, I'll make a macro uh, that'll like give a name to a scope and like implicitly take a query argument that you don't really see, but it'll just like var bang it into the, sub, the body of the thing. And then you can like pipe that into something else and like now you have these things that kind of act like scopes. Um, and I like thought about it and I was talking about it and I was talking on IRC about it. At some point, I think Jose or Eric, somebody was kind of like, why, like do you need to have a macro, like why don't you just like use, like pipe a query through this stuff? And that's where I was, I thought to myself like, oh yeah, like it kind of already does all of this for me automatically. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how that works. I think it's pretty obvious that the query expressions are composable, right? Like we're basically just threading a query through a bunch of functions that's adding or, or removing stuff from it and you're ending up with this piece of data at the end, it's a query. So clearly composable, right? You can just plug the stuff together. Interestingly, the keyword query syntax is also composable. Um, and it's, I, I didn't realize this at first. Um, so let's talk about how. So I thought it was like a special case that when I said from C in and I gave it a model name, I was like, oh, that's just kind of like the base case of the query, right? Like you just give it a model name, that's, that's what Ecto models are. But it turns out um, the this is, this is one case where it's a little thing, but I think it's where the implementation of Ecto really shines, is the name of a module that is an Ecto model is actually a query representing all of the data in the backing table for that model. So it's like, so my app.comment is, is essentially select star from comments, right? So it's this base query that is like everything in the table. What else is really cool about the keyword query syntax, but I think is something that we, we don't talk about as much, or at least I didn't understand at first, is that the subject of the query, that is the token to the right of the in, in the front line, can be any queryable, anything, right? So the reason you, you most often see a model in that slot, but that's just a side, of, not side effect, that's just a function of the fact that a model is just a query, right? The name of the model is just a query that represents everything. So what you can do is you can break apart the keyword query, like the, the, the larger one that we saw previously, into subqueries. So query one is just the name of our model, and that represents all the data in the backing table. Query two, we can add to query one, right? And it's, it's, these, these things are immutable as everything else in Elixir, right? But what we're doing is we're, we're creating a new query that is the original query plus some new constraints that we're adding to it. So the subject of query two is query one, and then we're sort of saying like, okay, we had the, all the comments before, right? Now we have all the comments, but only the ones where they have more than five votes. Um, same deal for query three, right? You just take the, so like query two is add this other constraint, we pass it to query three, add this join to it, it all sort of flows through and then we can finally execute it at the end. So it's like obvious that these are, these are composable too, right? Like it's hard to, it's hard to not notice that um, when you're doing the, the um, query expression stuff. It's just like clearly query in, query out. 
All good? Cool. So now we can just do like the stuff we do with functions in a functional language to make these easy to reuse and easy to read and like pleasant to use in our applications, which is we can extract reusable components, we can give them names that are useful, and we can compose them back together. So we can just name uh, those, those two fragments that we had pulled out in the previous query. We can name them popular, which is it takes a query in, it augments that query by saying we only care about the ones where they have more than five votes. We can name the other thing for post, which takes a query and an ID and only gives it and then like sort of constrains that to only the comments that are associated with that ID of the post we passed in. And then we end up with queries that look like that if you've aliased comment. And so like this is really interesting, right? Because we're just, I don't know, like we're just passing data through named functions that's, that's translating it. And then eventually we're ending the pipeline by just executing the query. So, so I, re I was really happy when I got to this point and I realized like, whoa, this is, it's just functional programming. Um, but it feels really nice. It feels as readable as like an ARL, uh, you know, train wreck of dots, in my opinion. Um, but it's like simple. There's no like real magic there, I guess. Uh, so I was happy with this. And I wrote a blog post on this, which you can go read afterwards. But then I, I thought to myself, like, so, so why does this work? Like, why is this pleasant? Why, why am I happy with the result that I arrived at here? Um, and I think the reason is because this is just another pipeline. Um, it's a, I'm calling it a query pipeline, but it's just a data pipeline like, uh, I don't know, any, any other pipeline you may have seen up to this point. So here's the, here's the query we just discussed. Um, I'm really happy that I came up with these names earlier and they matched <laughs> the names that everyone talked about today. So I am, I'm calling the beginning of the pipeline a source, the end of the pipeline a sync, and then each node in the pipeline a transformation. Um, and I think uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth sort of about what the responsibilities are of each of these stages in the pipeline. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more about sort of how that informs uh, some of the libraries that I've written. So disclaimer, I like made up all the type specs for each of these things. They're not real, but they're just there to kind of, uh, they're kind of just there to sort of inform your thinking about it. I saw a talk, I think maybe it was a couple of years ago at Strange Loop where Michael Feathers talked about using Haskell type signatures as a way to think about sort of the, the way that a function is, is working. Um, so I thought that would be useful to, to use to talk about these as well. So what is a source? Um, so a source is a thing that takes, so th this is where I'm cheating. Like it takes any number of arguments, but probably none of them is a query. And it gives you back a starting point for your query. Um, so it's the, it's the starting point. It's where you, where you generate the rest of your query from. So some examples. Uh, my app.post is a query uh, is a query source, like we described earlier. So any of your models in Ecto are actually like a source for a query pipeline. They just represent all the data in the table. Another place where I found this extremely useful are things like baking authorization into your queries. So suppose you have a current user in your Phoenix application, and you want to make sure you want to like you don't want to change your queries, right? You don't want to change the way that you're constraining your data, but you want the sort of starting bucket of stuff to be only the things that that user is authorized to see. Like that's a really good example of using a source for a query pipeline. You just hey, say pass in the current user and give me back the starting point that I care about for my queries that's constrained by that user. Uh, a transformation expands or constrains an existing query. So query in, query out, basically. Uh, you, can, you can give as many arguments as you want to the transformation, but we adhere to the fact that the first argument is always going to be the query. Maybe you give it some other stuff, and you always just get a query back. So that gives you the nice pipelining property uh, that we saw earlier. So most of the examples that we've seen are transformations, basically. They're, um, they're, when we add constraints to these queries, they're just transformations. So when we pass in a query to published, for example, it'll give us back posts where published is true. We pass in query and, and or, yeah, query post to comment, we get back comments that are associated with that post, but we're just transforming a query as it passes through. Last but not least, um, a sync executes a query and returns a result. Um, it's very intentional in this signature that the result is generic. Notice that I didn't say that it's a list of ecto models or a single ecto model or anything to do with an ecto model. 
It's just the result that we decide whatever the result is. I think that's important. Um, OK, so what are some examples of sinks? Well, I think we have the standard examples of sinks, which are the all and the one, which is probably what most folks use in their applications. So all takes a query and gives you back a list of ECTO models that adhere to the constraints of the query. One takes a query and gives you back a single item. Uh, there's bang versions of some of these as well. And then suppose someone had written the ability to paginate a query. Um, that would be a really nice sync as well, right? You could basically give your query to a thing, and its only responsibility is to give you a windowed view of the query, but not, not like modify the semantics of the query, right? Just, just give you a page of it and give you back some result that can help you keep paging over the stuff. Um, so uh, this, is, this, this, this way of thinking is what led me to write a library called Scrivener, which is a paginator for Ecto. So check it out if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to give a little, a little example of what like a lightweight version of pagination could look like as a sync. Um, the important thing to understand is, OK, so here's our query pipeline. The important thing to understand is pipelines are fractal um, in the sense that every stage in the pipeline can be a pipeline unto itself. All that matters is the level of abstraction that your user sees. So like any translation could include some number of sub-pipelines where it's building smaller queries that inform the way that it transforms the original query that was passed to it. Um, any sync could include some pipelines. Same with sources. So this is super important, and this is the way that I thought about um, building a pagination library for Ecto. So effectively, how, how did I think about building pagination as a sync in this pipeline? Well, it acts like a sync, but it's actually several smaller pipelines that are going to be responsible for collecting the data that's important to you when you paginate over a collection. So that may be the current page of results, or the total count of entries for the query, or the current page that you're on, uh, the next page, is it the last page, things like this. Um, I'm going to show a really small subset of that next. So suppose we wanted to write pagination on our repo. We could say myapp.repo, uh, we define our pagination function, it takes a query and then optionally takes a page number. And say that it returns, as our, we, we want our result object of the query to be just a, a tuple that returns the entries of the current page and say the total number of entries. There's a, there's a lot more you'd want and, and is, there's a lot more included in the library, but whatever. I think it's pretty obvious that each of those components of the tuple is its own pipeline. Um, we, we're, we're basically doing something different for each of them. So for entries, for example, we're taking the query and the page number and we're determining the offset based on that page number and our page size. And then we're limiting the query and offsetting it to get the current page. But what's really cool is like the, the offsetting and limiting functionality is totally decoupled from whatever the query is doing. Um, so I think that's really nice. And then we call all at the end to sync it. So notice that there's, like, there's, a, there's a whole pipeline right there. We're actually like executing a query there right, and getting, getting um, results back. For total entries, this really blew my mind. I was super happy that this functionality existed in Ecto. So when I started working on this library, I was like, this is great, this is awesome, I'm gonna be able to, you know, I'll get the entries, I'll figure out the page number, and then I'll like get the, I, I need the total count to figure out whether or not I'm on the last page. And it worked fine for really simple queries, but then I got to the point where I had a query that had an order by in it, or a preload, or a select, and it was like, well, you can't have multiple selects in your query, or you can't do a count if you have an order. And I was like, oh, I'm screwed. Like, I don't know what to do now. I could, I could just be like, you can't paginate that stuff, but that sucks, right? It's not, it's not nice to your user. You're sort of like, that's a leaky abstraction. Well, it turns out, yet again, I think the authors of Ecto made an awesome decision here, which is that you can actually pluck out clauses from a query to get back a new query that is the old query minus something that you took out. So what I was effectively able to do is say, like, okay, this is the query that you want me to paginate on. I can use that same query as a source to count the entries by excluding the clauses that are uncountable. So clauses like the order by, the preload, and the select. There's probably more here, too. Um, but I thought that was awesome, that you, could, that you could literally start with the same source, and because these things are immutable, you're not modifying anything. And I could literally, like, I'm effectively executing the same query twice, just kind of like massaging it a little bit, and then you get the results you care about, which uh, is pretty cool. If you want to see more uh, stuff about this, I've written a bunch of blog posts roughly in this same area, one that is titled the same as this talk. It's at blog.drollson.org because I'm terrible at SEO and didn't use a whatever 
slash thing. Um, and you can find Scrivener, the package that I wrote, uh, hex.pm slash packages slash Scrivener. Um, I went a little faster than I thought I would go, but thank you so much. That's uh, all I had, and I'd love to answer any questions anyone has.